details. If you have any questions while uh, watching the talk or at the end, please write them on the chat. We will be able to see them and we will ask, uh, we will transmit them to Emmanuel. Basically, that's how we're going to do uh, question and answers during the during the talk. And okay, I, I guess we can we can start. Um, it is really a pleasure and an honor to to introduce our speaker for our virtual Math Plus seminar this week. It's Emmanuel Candes from Stanford. Emmanuel has been an immense source of inspiration to me and to many many others. He has made many groundbreaking contributions in applied mathematics, signal processing, and statistics. They include uh, multidimensional generalizations of wavelets for multi-scale signal analysis, compressed sensing, COMEX optimization methods for sparse regression, matrix completion, phase retrieval, and the list goes on and on. His work achieves a remarkable balance. It is right at the intersection between theory and practice, providing mathematical understanding about real methodology that people actually use. Emmanuel was essentially building modern theoretical data science before the term even existed. Uh, we are again extremely honored and happy to have him here today. And today he's going to speak about reliability and fairness in predictive inference. Thank you very much. Uh, Carlos, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, okay. Thanks a lot for the very, very kind introduction, which is overly generous. Uh, and for the invitation to speak in this seminar. Uh, my talk it'll, will be very statistical today. I apologize about this, but it will really be about statistics and uh, about reliable predictions and whether we can treat people equitably or not. And so, um, you know, if you feel like asking questions during the talk, like just don't hesitate to interrupt me if something is not clear. So, uh, okay, and now I'm seeing my first glitch, which is that uh, you don't see the next slide. So just let me uh, just get back to, okay. So I'm gonna try to talk to you about conformal inference um, after a longish introduction. Uh, if I have time, I'll tell you three stories about conformal inference. Uh, one that involves conformal quanta regression, uh, one that is concerned with equitable treatment, and another which is more technical. And before I get started, I just want to thank three researchers who have introduced me to the wonderful work uh, of conformal inference. And these are Rina, Aditya, and Ryan. And um, we collaborated a lot over the last few years. Uh, unfortunately, this talk is not about the product of our collaboration, but I want to acknowledge the tremendous impact that this collaboration had on my thinking. And so uh, thanks to Rina, Aditya, and, and Ryan. Uh, this work that I'll present is joined with many students. Uh, first and foremost, perhaps Yanni Romano, who participated to all three stories that I'll, I'll, I'll explain. Okay, so as you know, uh, machine learning uh, used to be about things that were perhaps inconsequential. Uh, I remember being in interested in the Netflix prize about 15 years ago. Uh, the goal was to, of course, predict movie ratings and whether I get this right or wrong, it doesn't really matter. But now uh, we live in a new world where machine learning is deployed left and right in lots of different applications. And we switch from predicting movie ratings to, you know, uh, <clears throat> basically facial recognition scans to arrest people on the roadway. Uh, this is something that probably some of you have heard about. Uh, we use uh, machine learning to assist judicial decision to actually inform the judge about the risk of recidivism uh, of, a, of a person. I just want to read just to, sh to show you that the stakes are very high. Uh, Compass, so it's a, it's a product that you can buy from this company called Equivin. And Compass classification helps inform critical decisions and mitigate your risk. This nationally validated tool seamlessly integrates with your jail management system to provide critical inmate insight and help you manage each inmate, maximizing jail efficiency. So Compass at the moment is used, for example, to understand whether a judge should grant power or not, should allow bail or not. And so, of course, this is very different from the Netflix prize that we were discussing 15 years ago. Um, as you know, I think Amazon made the news lately about, you know, 
using AI that were biased towards certain individual to recruit employees. And now people use machine learning to help them in recruiting and scanning and sorting uh, CVs and, and so on. Uh, we're discussing, of course, the use of machine learning for, for personalized medicine, deep medicine. And so, <clears throat> again, this is a very, very sensitive um, application. Of course, at the same time, you're aware of the biases that machine learning algorithm uh, uh, may have. And it's not, you know, people would like to use machine learning because they think that they're going to reduce human biases, but they can introduce lots of biases as well. There were lots of articles uh, published about the machine bias that may be associated with, with some of the algorithms that are in current use. There is a call, uh, not only from researchers, but also from the highest level, from the, the White House, to actually try to design machine learning systems, or, you know, it seems that the media uses machine learning or AI interchangeably uh, so that it is fair and is not discriminating, uh, but rather um, uh, not, but, that, but do not harm people, right? So we would not need to develop algorithms that are robust to skews in the data that are not biased and, and so on and so forth. So, and then that's a, that's a call and that's a call that we need to take seriously and then we need to uh, respond to. So there is a common myth in, uh, in the world at the moment that data leads to action. Uh, data does not lead to action. Um, and there are many reasons for that. First of all, uh, data is not equivalent to knowledge. Data does not speak for itself, uh, contrary to what I can read everywhere. Uh, it's actually extremely difficult to extract actionable and useful information from data sets. As a proof of case in point, I witnessed a tremendous crisis that we have in the reproducibility of science research. If it was useful to extract data, uh, information from data, then I do not understand why so many studies that I see, that the world sees being published, do not replicate. Um, the second is that data does not imply a model framework or a value system. Uh, data does not tell us what we should do. There's a difference between, and I'll try to make this point very clear later on, there's a difference between a machine learning algorithm and a policy decision. These are not the same thing. And people usually conflate the two, uh, which is somehow troubling. Okay, so having uh, said this, uh, what I would like to propose in this talk, or what we're thinking of at Stanford with my collaborators is a, a data ethic frameworks, which is not grand, uh, it's very minimal. Um, and what you'll hear in this lecture is we need to recognize that data analysis is non neutral. It's very important how I'm going to convey information to decision makers in sensitive applications. And I need to think carefully about the way I'm going to summarize information. That is what I learned from the experience of others, right? So when we use machine learning, you have people like me and I can try to learn from people like me. And it's important that I convey in an accurate way what I've learned from people like me. Another thing that we need to be careful about is we do not, cannot afford to conflate data analysis with a decision rule and we'll make this precise later in the talk. Again, there's a distinction between the outcome of an algorithm and outcome of a prediction and a policy. And so the job of a data scientist is to empower the user not to substitute him or herself to decision makers. And of course, the French principle is do no harm. That is, be a professional, the stakes are high. Okay? And I think of course, the pandemics that we're going through, very, very clear that the stakes are high. All right, so having gone through this sort of, uh, and again, I keep on losing my thing, so I'm going to need to do this uh, back and forth, uh, swap in and out of notability. Um, so, in, you know, if I think about data ethics 101, well, what I need to know is like I need to convey uncertainty 
and make reliable predictions. So just as a, as a toy example, imagine that I have a quantitative outcome such as a GPA, right? So now lots of applications, you know, universities receive a lot of applications. You know, I think Stanford received over 60,000 applications. It might be conceivable that at some point we're gonna to try to sort, to automate the triage of some of these applications. And so you might imagine, you know, of course, I'm not saying this exists, but this is hypothetical to frame the discussion that you have a system that would try to predict how well would do a student would do at Stanford if he or she were admitted to this university. And so let's say you have a machine learning algorithm. Uh, maybe it's a very complex thing. Maybe it's a neural net. Maybe it's, you know, XG boost. Maybe something extremely simple, uh, complicated, sorry, that produces an outcome of how well a student will do a quantitative outcome. Let's say, let's say the system predicts that after two years of college, your GPA will be about 3.62. I think we understand that it's extremely important. If I use this number to make, to make decisions, it's, imp it's truly important to trust this number. And so the first thing a statistician would ask is, what is 362 plus or minus one? How am I supposed to interpret this result? So we need really uh, to communicate reliable outcomes. And one question I have is like, instead of just giving me a point prediction, uh, if, you, if the issue is about reliability, why don't you just give me a prediction in a, that is a range of values that you can actually trust? And that's what we're gonna be um, talking about. So why don't we see prediction intervals? It's because perhaps uh, now, and sorry, I'm sorry, I'm gonna have to do this a lot. It's because now we use extremely complex uh, machine learning algorithms, right? We are way beyond uh, simple regressions. Um, we use random forest, gradient boosting, neural nets, sometimes a combination of this. You see on my slide some of the pioneers of these methods, and one of them is at NYU. And, uh, and so we use these very complex models, uh, this complex machinery, and it's very difficult to perform inference after using things that honestly, for practical purposes, we should almost consider as complete black boxes. So we'll see that uh, people want to use these uh, modern methods to perform uh, prediction, to kind of get accurate predictions if, when, when they're possible. Uh, but the thing is, how can I, I, I trust these predictions and what kind of guarantees am I gonna associate with these predictions? So this motivates the first talk in our lecture which is about conformalized quantile regression, which is joint work with a postdoc, Yaniv Romano, and a graduate student of mine, Evan Patterson. So the point of view that you know, we're gonna take in this talk is to talk about prediction intervals. And to me, it's very important that we see prediction intervals more and more, rather than just point estimates. And it's very difficult for me to assess the reliability of a point estimate. So what we want to construct is something like this. You give me a bunch of training data uh, uh, over here, x1, y1 through xn, yn, y is a response of interest. I'm going to assume that these data are exchangeable. This is a, a, you know, if you don't know what that means, you can assume that the iid, exchangeable, is a relaxed version of being iid. And uh, there is a, so these are perhaps the X1, Y1, Xn, Yn are the students I've seen in the database, I've seen their performance. And then I have a candidate student, Xn plus one. I've got a lot of features for this student. I know the high school she went to, I know her high school GPA, I know her ACT scores, I know whether she competes uh, in sports at a very high level or not, things like that. And what I would like to do is I would like to predict the why for that person. And the goal we're gonna set for ourselves is quite simply stated, uh, the goal will be to construct a marginal free, a, dis a marginal confidence interval. That is, instead of giving a point estimate, which everybody can do, uh, what I want is I want to create a, an interval, which we're gonna call C of Xn plus one. So a range of predictions such that this range, so you're gonna return a range and the standard I'm holding you 
two is this. That is a chance that y belongs to the range you're giving me must be at least 90%. And not only this, but this has to hold no matter what the distribution of x, y is, which is assumed, of course, to be completely unknown, and no matter what the sample size is. So what we're gonna do, the, the question we'd like to answer, uh, the, 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 the object we'd like to construct is a predictive interval that contains a true label, the true outcome 90% of the time, or 95% of the time, whatever it is. And this has to hold, no matter the distribution of the covariates and the response, no matter the sample size. And so why do I want to do this? I want to do this because I want to be able to say that based on the candidate's high school identifier and all the things that are measured about the candidate, I want to be able to say with some form of confidence that the predictive uh, GPA will fall in the range 3.5 or 3.8. Okay. And of course, I want these intervals to be short, and that's why I want to use these goodies that people have, uh, have created in over the last few years, right? So better predictions will lead to shorter intervals, and so that's why I want to use these kind of extremely powerful methods, these black boxes, if you will. Okay. So um, usually uh, data will be uh, highly heteroscedastic, meaning that the noise distribution, if you will, the uncertainty depends on where you are in covariate space. Uh, here you see uh, an example of um, a data set, which is of course a synthetic data set in this case. Uh, on the left, you see over here the full range view of the data sets of both Y and X. And on the right, I just clip the y-axis to show you just uh, values between minus two and six. And what you can see clearly by just following my pen is that somehow the distribution varies greatly as you move in, in x space. So we would like to have a, a predictive intervals that reflect the nature of the data and are adaptive. That is, they are short when there's a possibility of giving me a short interval, like so, for example, when x equals three, and they are wide when it's becoming more difficult, for example, when X is sort of 1.5. So we want to create informative bands. And so to really to capture the heterogeneity in the data as best as we can. All right, so I'm going to discuss uh, a setting, uh, an, an idea, which of course is not an idea, it's what you would do if you had perfect knowledge. And so if I had perfect knowledge about the problem, um, then uh, what I would do is I would look at, uh, if I knew the conditional distribution of y given x, then I would have an easy solution to my predictive problem. And I would do the following. For each value of x, which we see on this axis, I would actually have a distribution of y given this value of x. I will calculate the quantile of this distribution. I will do this for every possible x. And then I will just connect these quantiles, and that will be my answer. Okay? And as you see, if we have heterogeneous heterogeneity in the data, as we can see in this example, the lengths of the intervals would vary greatly depending on where I, I am in predictor space. But of course, uh, I don't have knowledge of P of Y given X. If, I knew the, sample, the distribution of y given x, and of course, there's no need for data science. Well, there's no need to predict anything. Everything is known, so there is no perfect knowledge. You only have a few samples from the distribution of y given x, so what are you going to do? And here in this work, we're going to try to uh, combine two ideas. And the first idea uh, is actually old in the literature of statistics. Uh, it's called quantile regression, and there's a wonderful paper by Roger Kunker and Gilbert Bassett that I would encourage everyone to read uh, from 1978 that we're going to try to leverage. And so <clears throat> what we can do is we can try to format, formulate the quantile estimation problem. Remember that I'm trying to estimate the quantiles of the distribution of y given x to return a predictive interval. And I can, re I can frame quantile estimation as a learning task. And so if you 
<coughs> think a little bit about this, um, I can try to find f, which is going to be a fitted quantile function, and it's going to uh, be the solution to this optimization problem where I'm going to trade off a loss function. But the loss function is not the squared loss now. It's what uh, machine learning or people call the pinball loss, uh, which is a loss that you see over here. And so it is a loss that looks like absolute values, except you have two different slopes, uh, a slope alpha and a slope one minus alpha. And if I look, if I use this loss function on infinite data, uh, on infinite sample size, then uh, what the minimization problem will be, it will not be the conditional mean of y given x. The solution will be the quantile, the alpha, the one minus alpha quantile of y given x. Of course, I can try to regularize it, especially if I use these modern methods like uh, gradient boosting and so on. But the idea is to reformulate quantile regression as a learning problem by minimizing a loss, which is not the squared loss, but rather the pinball loss, which has this kind of shape. And so I can run this on data for alpha equals 0.05 and alpha equals 0.95, and I'm going to get two quantiles, the fifth percentile, which is the curve that you see um, on the bottom over here, and the 95th percentile, just purely fitted from the data uh, on the top. And I can use my black boxes to do this, right? I can use neural nets, I can use backprop, I can use whatever you feel uh, would do a good job at predicting the quantiles from uh, sample data. Okay, so, um, so that's the idea of quantile regression, does it work? And the answer is no. And in fact, uh, imagine training a neural net, you know, you know, there's lots of paper nowadays in the machine learning literature where basically people drive the training error to zero. So in this case, you would have that both quantiles actually match. And of course, the coverage would be a disaster. By being a bit less dramatic here, what we did is we fitted a, a neural net to a, the synthetic data set that I've introduced earlier. I got these two curves, right? One is the bottom curve, one is the top curve. And then I uh, revealed a new uh, test set and I checked the coverage. And so of course you do good when a test point falls between in the slightly gray area that I hope you see on your computer screen you do well when the, a test point falls in between these two curves. And uh, unfortunately, uh, when I fit this quantile regression, uh, it does not achieve the 90% level, coverage level, it achieves much less. So I'm far too confident about what I really know, right? So I believe that you know, the range is something like this when in fact it's much wider Okay, and again, imagine training a neural net uh, with, you know, phonemic tuned values of the parameters, you could actually get a coverage rate, which is essentially zero. So that doesn't work, and so we're going to need to fix this problem. So, in general, uh, estimating quantize reliably is a difficult problem. There's no finite sample guarantees. There are some consistency results, and I give important references as the sample size increases under various regularity conditions, in assuming very specific models, a bit outside of what we want to do here, which is I do not want to uh, assume a model a priori as a distribution of X and Y should be whatever it is, and I want to work in finance. So, <coughs> we're going to wrap around uh, our black box that fits these quantiles to, uh, to, uh, to discuss this. And so what is the, uh, the, the, the main idea? The main idea is you give me uh, uh, some data set, a data set, and I'm going to split it into what we're going to call a proper training set, which is over here, and a calibration set, which is over here, right? So I'm going to do data splitting, Maybe 80% of the data points will go on the left, maybe 20% will go on the right. And then we're gonna do what we've seen. That is, I'm gonna apply quantile regression with my favorite black box model 
maybe XGBoost, maybe deep learning, whatever seems to work best. I'm going to apply, uh, but with a loss function such so that I feed quantize. Uh, by the way, I should say that if you were to use as a loss function just the absolute value, um, I think you know that what minimizes the mean absolute deviation is a median. And so this is just an extension of this. So I would find two quantiles, a fifth percentile and a 95th percentile, and on the empirical data, and they're represented on the left. But then I have a calibration set, and I'm going to try to see how well I'm doing on my calibration set, the data that I have reserved that has not been used to fit the quantiles. And the calibration set, I'm going to calculate scores. That is, for each green point in the calibration set, I'm going, to calc I'm going to calculate a score. And this score can be positive, and we'll see that this score is positive if it's not inside the region, the predictive region, and it's negative otherwise. Right? So if a point falls inside the region, you're going to be receiving, each point is going to be scored, each test point is going to be scored, and the score will be positive if I missed it, that is, it's not, it's outside of the, of the predicted interval, and it's going to be negative, it's inside. Now let me show you how we're going to define the score in, in this work. So uh, the figure on the right is exactly the figure I introduced earlier. Uh, we're going to score points. And the definition of the score is what you see over here a score EI would be the maximum between two numbers. It's going to be the maximum between YI and the up value of the upper percentile, and the maximum between the lower value, that is this curve, and the YIs. So uh, if you think about what it means on my picture, it means that a score is simply a signed distance to the boundary. So it is how far is this point to the nearest boundary? If you're outside of the predicted interval, this distance is positive. If you're inside the predicted interval, you're also going to get a score, which is a, the distance to the boundary, but with a negative sign. So you, you see who is the nearest boundary. Is it the upper or the lower? And then you're getting a plus sum plus distance if you're outside, minus distance if you're outside, if you're inside. Okay? So this is what I'm trying to see to say here. EI is going to be the sign distance to the boundary. EI is negative if I'm inside and it's positive otherwise. So for each point in the calibration set, I calculate a score like this. And then so let's say I have 300 points in the calibration set. So suppose I have 300 points in the calibration set, what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at the 90th percentiles of these scores, right? So it's going to be, I'm going to look at the 270th largest value of these scores. Okay, I'm going to call this number Q. Okay, so it's a number, it's a real number, right? So I get 300 scores. I order them, I take the 270th largest value, and that's a number Q. Note that this number Q will be positive if somehow the fitted quantiles are too narrow. So if uh, I overfitted the data in the training stage, then more points will be outside of the range, and so the 90th percentile of the scores will be positive. If you've had a very good algorithm that actually understood how to fit quantiles, then this Q number would be zero, right? So if I were roughly zero, right? So if you had somehow found the right percentiles from the training, from the uh, proper training set, then roughly 90% of the data points would be inside, 10% would be outside, and therefore Q would be roughly zero. Conversely, if you were a bit like me, 
uh, over, a bit overly conservative. Uh, you really do not want to overfit. You want to be confident in your prediction. Maybe this, if these boundaries were too wide, that you were a bit too conservative, you were fitting intervals that are too wide, then interestingly, you'd have too few points out, this Q would be negative. Whatever Q is, the final uh, prediction interval would be, you're going to adjust your prediction interval with Q and the range that you predict for a person with attributes Xn plus one would just be your lower minus Q, your upper plus Q. Again, note that if you had done a very good job during training, Q would essentially be zero and you would decide not to touch it. If you were anti-conservative, you would enlarge this interval. You would realize that they are too small and you would enlarge them. If, like me, you were a bit too conservative, you would actually shrink them. That it would actually give you a chance to actually make them smaller. Okay. Now, when I use this method on uh, uh, the data set that we've seen before, uh, the results are almost too good to be true. Uh, what this does is it achieves uh, a coverage, which at least in this example is, uh, I mean, as I said, too good to be true. Um, so I fitted the quantize, I reveal a test set that I have never seen before. And I look at the fraction of points that feel that fall within range and I want 90% on this example, I got 90.09%. Did I get lucky? Uh, not really, uh, it's a result. And the first time you see results like this, you say, uh, no, Emmanuel, like, that cannot be right. Um, but, but it is actually correct. That is the guarantees you have for the method I just gave you is, the, the, is this, which is that the chance that a data point falls within range is above one minus alpha and below one minus alpha plus one over the number of calibration points you have. And so you have extremely tight coverage. Uh, it's, you're at least 90% over here and you're like 90 plus epsilon over there. And that holds no matter what the distribution of P is, no matter the sample size and regardless of choice of of choice or accuracy of your quantile regression estimates. So you produces a range that you can actually, you can stand behind your range. All right, so as I mentioned at the early, uh, early in the talk, uh, the inspiration is of course, uh, conformal inference, uh, the wonderful work, line of work initiated by Vladimir Hofk, uh, who is in England, um, and so, of course, we've been inspired by, by his work and his methods and the way he looks at things. And really what you've just heard is an improvement. We believe it's an improvement on some of the methods that they have developed. So uh, to go a bit back in time, uh, the way you do a classical conformal prediction uh, a la Wolfk is uh, as follows. Uh, you're going to fit a regression function instead of quantize. And then you're going to look at a calibration technique that looks like this. So, so I give you a data set, um, uh, you fit a regression function, you have, then you look at residuals, RI, which is uh, the absolute deviation between the response Y in your calibrated set minus the fitted mean. You, going to look at the quantiles of the residuals over here. And then uh, you're going to construct a prediction intervals, which is simply the regression function plus or minus the quantiles. And so uh, Wolfk proved that this method achieves one minus alpha coverage. So uh, this is really uh, excellent. What we take issue with is the way uh, we take issue with the way the, the, the predictive interval is constructed. So one thing you can notice immediately, which goes against what I've talked about, is that if you look at the width of your confidence interval, it's fixed. It does not depend on when you are in space. Even though data can be extremely heterogeneous, uh, you would have an interval of constant width, which is, in my view, 
a major limitation. And so uh, going back to the test case, the data set I've shown you before, uh, this is a, uh, the data set we've seen before, we see the two ways of actually performing conformal inference. On the left, you have the method uh, due to Volk, where we basically gonna fit a regression function. And this is the black line that you see um, uh, on the left uh, over here, right? So the black line. And then I'm gonna look at the quantiles of the residuals and take the quantiles of the absolute value of the residual. And I'm gonna construct the symmetric interval of fixed lengths around the prediction function. And so that leads to uh, the range in pink that you see on the left. Of course, it achieves coverage at the theorem by Wolfk that it achieves coverage. The length is high, so it's 2.9. On the right, you see the method we propose, uh, CQR, a conformalized quantile regression. And you can see that, of course, this is far more faithful to the data distribution. As a result, we get intervals whose length uh, does not vary across space. And the average coverage is, um, of course, 90%, which is what you want. <coughs> but because you have a way more flexible way, uh, a tool to actually build this predictive interval, the length is much smaller. So CQR is adaptive, while speed conformal is not. Uh, now, people have tried to, uh, okay, and again, I have to come and sweep it out. People have tried to uh, uh, come around this uh, lack of adaptivity that you see in conformal methods. Uh, you can try to estimate a mean and the standard deviation, but that doesn't work very well. Our experience is that it doesn't work well. And so uh, that's why I can sort of say that, and we've done lots of comparisons across lots of different data sets, that CQR is largely the, the right thing to do in our view. Okay. Um, all right. And so these are the ways where, you know, you can try to not only estimate the mean, but you can try to estimate the, a form of heteroscedasticity parameters, they still believe that the model is actually mean plus uh, symmetric error, which is not the case most of the time. And now you have to deal with the fact that you're estimating lots of things simultaneously. Um, and so the method is not very stable and uh, intervals are not very adaptive. And that's, that's what we found. Okay. Um, so we've used, uh, CQR to actually predict lots of things. Uh, so we downloaded lots of data sets. Um, one data set that was interesting to us was to be able to predict utilization of medical services. Uh, there's a medical expenditure panel survey from 2015 where the covariates are what you would imagine, age, marital status, race, which we'll talk about later, uh, you know, poverty status, health status, the kind of insurance you have, and so on. And so you measure these variables about an individual, and what you would like to understand is how much of the healthcare system are you going to utilize? So how many visits to the doctors or to the hospitals and so on? And so we want to predict Y from X. Uh, this is a fairly big data set where we have 16,000 subjects measured around 140 um, for, it, for each of which we have 140 features. Okay. And so uh, <clears throat> what we see is, of course, the method can be trained on anything you like. Uh, we train it on random forest and neural nets. And so um, what we see here is the average length of, uh, maybe I'll focus on the two box plots at the bottom. So you have two methods, CQR, wrapped around random forest or neural nets. These box plots are quite boring if you look at them because what you see here is you want 90% coverage for um, your prediction and you get 90% almost exactly. And here you see the, the CQR for neural nets. What's very interesting to me is that it has shorter lengths or about equal lengths that if you were just to just do 
quantile neural nets, not really knowing what you're doing, which will not achieve coverage. It actually covers and has shorter lengths, which is kind of a surprise to me. So it seems like you don't lose much by being sure about what you want to tell people. So secure achieve exact coverage, while the black box, of course, would not. And they offer competitive intervals and sometimes even shorter than methods that do not even, that are anti-conservative, which is a bit of a, a mystery to me. Okay, uh, when we compare CQR with lots of uh, other methods to do conformal inference, uh, we see that uh, we tend to uh, observe shorter average lengths uh, than competing methods, and that's why we like this method. Now, we've tried lots of different data sets. If you go to the paper, uh, which was published to NeurIPS earlier this year, in years earlier this year, you'll see lots of data experiments. Uh, and each time it seems that CQR outperforms other conformal uh, methods. Again and again and again. These are very different data sets. Uh, and so it seems that it's a method that tends to perform well across the board. Okay, so uh, basically what I'm trying to say here is we can build new prediction intervals using quantile regression. They would actually, you can stand by what you say. Um, and so it outperforms other conformal methods. At least we tried 11 data sets and 10 times uh, CQR was uh, leading the, in terms of, uh, of length. And it's a good time to take questions if people have questions, otherwise you can just go on. Um, sorry, Mark, I have a question. Yeah. So um, how, how should I think about this uh, method in the regime where, I mean, the, basically eggs are very high dimensional and you only basically observe, uh, you know, one point in the distribution, condition distribution of Y given X, and you are mostly relying on basically these very big, non, very, these very big models where mm -hmm. basically you just fit these quantile models to the data. So in that case, how do you, so, is, is, there, is there an easy way to think about how these intervals can actually vary with respect to X? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, so here we have quite a lot of variation as a function of X in all these experiments. Again, the guarantee, so there are two questions, right? One is the adaptivity and how the, 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 the intervals vary in, in width. Uh, this will actually depend on the kind of quantile function, you, the method you fit to fit the quantiles. So you'll see, that some intervals are narrow and others are, are wide. And we're gonna talk about this in a minute, by the way. Uh, the other is like the guarantee we provide is, it, it doesn't matter the dimensionality of the data, is such that when a new person comes in, uh, you're gonna be correct 90% of the time. Now it's the weakness of the method and is that it's marginalized over people you're gonna have out So I cannot say, that for people with these characteristics, the coverage is this. What I can say is for the next 100 applicants, I will be correct 90% of the time. And I think I'm saying this to anticipate what's coming next. All right, so I'll continue. And uh, I think I will not have time to talk about story number three. So I'll just talk about story number one and story number two. And uh, story number two is going one step beyond and of course making the link between what I announced at the beginning, which is that when we report the results of data analysis, when we think that there are people like us and they should inform uh, uh, predictions, uh, can we make sure that this is done in an equitable way? And so this is work with Yaniv, uh, Rina, and, and Kiara. Okay, so I want to go back to my previous data set. Of course, the example will not be dramatic in this case, but you can imagine examples that are very dramatic. Um, there is an, a variable here, which is race, which is by, by law is a protected attribute. And you should not discriminate uh, based on race. Um, uh, and so that's by law. 
And so we can look at how the neural nets perform um, on, uh, on, uh, on people according to race. So I can look at the, at the outcome of the neural net. So I feed a neural net work regression function mu hat uh, to the data set. And I kind of observe empirically that the neural net tend to overestimate the responses of the non-white group. So in, a, in, a, in a way, the algorithm is biased against non-whites because it over-predicts uh, healthcare utilization. At the same time, it underestimates the response for the white group. And so in terms of, um, of uh, conformal inference, if I look at the, mark, the, the coverage level broken down by whether you're white or non-white, I would see that I'm overcovering for non-white and undercovering for um, uh, the whites. So I achieve what I'm going to call unequal coverage. The kind of guarantees I can provide are not the same depending on what group you belong to. Okay, so, um, okay, and I don't know why this keeps on, okay. So we want to kind of discuss uh, how we can fix this. And I think, of course, it relates to what people will talk about in the algorithmic fairness literature in machine learning. Um, in machine learning, people are, of course, very worried about these biases in feeding algorithms. And, you know, when you have sort of fairness metrics, that have the names of statistical priority calibration, which is what Compass used, the algorithm I used early on, I showed early on. Uh, equalize odds and so on. It's a wide literature at the moment. Uh, I want to acknowledge uh, the wonderful work of Alexandra Shuldeshova, who is at CMU, uh, who organizes and develops a lot of knowledge around algorithmic fairness. One notion that, for example, people discuss in uh, algorithmic fairness is this notion of equalized odds. And it's a notion that looks good when you look at it uh, initially, and then it makes you pause a bit, according to what I said early on. Um, the insights come from binary classification, where you have a Y, which takes on two values, 0 or 1, whether you commit another crime or not, let's say, and Y hat, which is your prediction, which is also going to be binary. And so what equalize odds, demands of a feeding algorithm, of a machine learning algorithm, is that the prediction, that your prediction, that y hat takes the value y hat, given that the true outcome is little y, is the same regardless of something you'd like to be unbiased against, right? So regardless of the value of the protected attributes. So that is that your decision, given that you've observed the outcome, should be independent of the protected attribute. Right? So what this is doing in terms of uh, random variables, if you will, is that we have three random variables here. We have the outcome of interest that we're trying to predict. We have a protected attribute A, and then we have uh, the prediction y hat and what equalized words wants is that it will ask that this that y hat does not is conditionally independent of a given given one. Okay, and that sounds like perhaps like a good idea. Well, one of the things is if you fit neural nets and so on, like how would you actually achieve this? And it's a bit unclear how one would achieve equalized odds in practice. Um, but I think I want to point out to a larger issue, which has to do with my length introduction. And the larger issue is this. You may have two groups, okay? And for, you know, when we have a simple classification problem like this, there's this notion of true positives or false positive, true negative, false negatives, and so on. And so I may have two groups, um, uh, let's say male and female, and uh, maybe I run a classification algorithm, and for males, I have a true positive rate of, let's say, 9 in 10. 
And for female, maybe in this example, females are a bit harder to predict. Uh, maybe there's more variability in female. Maybe you have less data about female. And so the true positive rate is lower. It's 5 over 10. Well, equalized odds would insist that the true positive and the rate be the same across the two groups. Now, how do you achieve this? Well, if females are hard to predict, then you're going to have to lower the accuracy of your algorithm on the male group. And so what that means concretely is that what you're going to have to do once you think a little bit about what equalized odds is asking of you is you're going to ask, you know, you need to match the true positive rates because that's a requirement. And uh, you're going to say that they must be the same. And that, what that means concretely is that there are these individuals who would fairly confident about their why, but now you have to mask your knowledge actually, so that your accuracy matches the accuracy on the other group. And so if I may talk about crudely, you're gonna to have to flip individuals. You have, there were, you had knowledge about, you, you could pr safely predict that some individuals would do well or poorly, it doesn't matter to me, but you're gonna to have to change what you know about this individual so that you match the error rates on perhaps the hardest to learn uh, group. And I don't think that's what you want. You know, this is not your job as a data scientist, as a statistician, to actually convey things that I did not ask you. What you have to tell me is you have to treat people equitably and you have to tell me what you know about an individual and not play these kind of games where you're going to substitute yourself to a decision maker and, 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 and actually bias your report in, in, in some ways. So again, uh, you know, what equalized odds would say that, you know, the true positive rates and the false must match, the false positive rates must match, but maybe, you know, I have an algorithm and these are the hour seeker from this hour. How can they match? They are never crossing. And even if they were to cross, uh, they might not cross at the point you care about. And so this is, I think, a bit problematic. So as I said in the introduction, the point of this work and the way we see the world is that we need to decouple the statistical problem from the policy problem. And, you know, I'm not the first one to make this point. In fact, I read this paper by Corbett Davis and Gorel, where uh, Gorel is my colleague at Stanford. And he says it very nicely. They say very nicely in a paper that really influenced our methodology enormously. Um, an algorithm might correctly infer that a defendant has a 20% chance of committing a violent crime if released, but that fact does not in and of itself determine a course of action, right? There are two things. There's a learning problem. What can I infer from the experience of others? And then there's a policy problem and they are not the same. You know, I can correctly infer that a group of individuals might perform better at Stanford academically than another group but it does not imply that Stanford should admit only people from this group. Okay, so this leads to uh, equalized coverage. And uh, what we're gonna do, what we're gonna do is we're gonna go one step further in what we've seen. We're gonna try to construct perfectly calibrated intervals across all groups. And so what I want is I want to say a students apply to Stanford, I want to kind of predict a quantitative outcome that I care about that I'm going to use perhaps for admit that I'm going to look at for admiss admission purposes. But I want that this, first of all, I want to convey uncertainty about the outcome. So I want to give you a predicted range. And second, I want that this predicted range be valid no matter the group you belong to. And so the, the, in my previous example, what I need to do is a male or a female comes with his or her own attributes. And for each, I want to produce a predictive range that is 90% of the correct, regardless of whether you're male or female. I, do, I want to treat people equally. So I think this is a way of conveying information that summarizes what machine learning has to tell about your problem in two ways. Number one, it rigorously quantifies uncertainty. And two, it treats people in individually. That is, you're not biased against a group by being 
extremely liberal about one group and extremely conservative for another group. Okay, so how would you do this? Let's say I have uh, two groups, minority and majority groups, and here they are. Um, well, uh, what we could do is we could, of course, separate them and train separately and then calibrate separately. And so pretending that we have two populations that have nothing to do with each other. Um, but of course, a better strategy might be to actually merge them. So the method we recommend using is, of course, we want to learn from the experience of others. So we're going to merge these individuals in the training sample. But then when I calibrate, when I perform the calibration, uh, I'm going to separate individuals so that the predictions, the predicted intervals are valid, regardless of the group you belong to. All right, and if you do, do this, uh, 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 according to this, then you see that it fits, you know, so these are boring tables because the theorem is that, of course, regardless of the group you belong to, the average is, you want 90%, you will get exactly 90%. Uh, if we look at the, 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 it's again my MEPS example, again, if you look at the blue rows of this data table, we have the coverage over here. This is about training individuals separately, non-whites and whites separately. This is about training them jointly. Uh, two observations. Number one, the coverage is always 90%, but by now you should be used to this. Uh, number two is that if you train jointly, you achieve smaller lengths because, of course, uh, even though you don't belong to the same group, people from a different group may inform uh, prediction, um, uh, predicting healthcare utilization. So CQR produces shorter intervals still. And the joint training we find is usually more powerful than just doing separate training. Mm -hmm. So in summary, I think this leads to honest reporting. If you find that the interval is long, then I think what you can say is that you have to be honest about what you know about your model. And it said that the model can say little. Um, some limitations mm -hmm. of the method is that uh, you're going to need data and protected attributes. And of course, we need sufficient sample size for calibration. Now, uh, there's lots of uh, code that we have. If people are interested in this technology, uh, we have website, we have code, and people should feel free to use uh, everything we have. Now, I have a third part, but I see that it's 11.58 on my computer screen, which must be different times around the world. Um, this is the last part had to do with what if you don't have a lot of data, so the splitting is a bit expensive. There are ways of reusing data uh, that I was about to talk about, and that's joint work with Rina, Aditya, Ryan, and Yaniv. But because I'm short on time, uh, I'll skip here. I can give my slides uh, if people want to read about this, but I don't want to take too much of your time. So I think it's better that I do not cover story three Story three is about what do, you, what do you do when your data starve? And so can you do better than just a bit of splitting? Can you do data reuse so that you can use data both for calibration and training at the same time? So, uh, so there was quite a bit of stuff uh, that I'm going to skip now. Uh, and so in conclusion, I want to say that we're thinking enormously about effective inference centered around predictions uh, in our research group. Uh, the goal is to do reliable and informative predictions, to treat people equitably, not to play God. Uh, again, I have to summarize what the data say about my problem. The goal is not to bake ideology into an algorithm. Uh, and then there are things I do not have time to say. And with this, I'd like to uh, thank you for your attention.